more people venture out, it stands to reason that we're going to see more cases of the coronavirus. There's going to be a spike. It's just a matter of just how bad will it be. So Aaron Bromage, Bromage rather, sorry, Aaron, is trying to help people navigate the science behind uh, the COVID-19 epidemic with this really informative blog. Uh, he's a comparative immunologist and professor of biology at the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. Um, and one of your posts, he's joining us now, Aaron, one of your posts, most recent ones, the risks, know them, avoid them. It's getting a lot of attention. And I'll tell you what I really like about your blog that I think we're really not getting from other from voices of authority, if you will, um, is you explain the why, why you need to wear a mask, why you should uh, be distancing from people. We get a lot of instructions about what to do, but you really break down the science of the why. Um, as people start to venture out more, and you know, I can already see just in, in Philadelphia, you probably noticed it in New York too, Vlad, that you know, whether restrictions are lifted or not, people are just antsy and they're, and they're getting out there anyways. As they begin to venture out more, what do you think are, um, I guess, the greatest risks that we're facing? Well, thanks for having me on the show, Anne-Marie. The greatest risks that we're facing is we're becoming more mobile, and as we become more mobile, we have more interactions. Every interaction that we have with another person, another household, gives an opportunity for the virus to find a new home and to get into a new household and keep this cycle that we've seen going for the last two months going further and possibly even amplify. So um, to continue on that thread that Amory was talking about, um, what areas represent the highest risk of exposure? Uh, are we talking about grocery stores? Are we talking about the park? Are we talking about air travel? Um, because I, I, what I've experienced, Emory, is what you said, that there are a lot more people that are out and about outdoors, but it feels to me as if New Yorkers are still uh, apprehensive about going into enclosed spaces. Uh, I don't know that we're mm -hmm. gonna see the rush to gyms and uh, to restaurants and bars uh, when they open the way that we've seen in some other states. Yeah, so there's a, a gradation of risks, and I've seen um, there's some really great uh, uh, animations and uh, drawings coming out, one of them by Professor Ellie Murray, showing sort of this risk spec spectrum as well. And it's outdoors, where you can maintain social distancing, uh, your least concerning place to be. Uh, as you start getting into outdoors with another family, it starts, the risk starts to come up with, then indoors becomes a, a higher problem. And then the most risky is getting into a situation where you're indoors with lots of people and poor airflow. That is just a, a recipe for virus transmission uh, through a lot of people. Um, so in sort of your latest blog that's getting a lot of attention, you, you sort of really show how indoor spaces can be the most, um, the most, uh, I guess, riskiest, but also not just, it's not just the indoor spaces, it's also what people are doing too. And you sort of break down how talking and breathing and coughing and seizing, how there are different risk factors associated with that. Yeah, so if you're in a, a library that maintains a quiet environment and a lot of space between people, even though that's an indoor environment, the chances of uh, viral transmission is really quite low. But if you get into an environment that brings people together and it's noisy, uh, say it's a, a bar environment where you need to yell uh, to get heard or you need to get closer to the people in the bar to be able to have a conversation, as soon as those things happen, you've got to speak louder, which puts more force into the air that comes out, which means more droplets come out and if you are infected, that means you're putting more virus into the air uh, and increasing the chance of virus transmission. You, you know, Aaron, can you just, at least for our viewers who may be wondering about the steps that are necessary to protect not just yourself, but others around you. So even as these states start to open up, even as uh, places of business start to open up, you're seeing a lot of resistance from people uh, with regards to wearing masks. And it's so telling when you watch across the world in other countries, um, specifically in Asia, but also in Europe and in, in Latin America, people who are wearing masks on a regular basis, um, even as the numbers have come down uh, in their countries. And here, you're seeing a resistance 
resistance to that, people seemingly acting as if it's an infringement of their civil liberties to wear a mask. Can you explain why, given some of the risks that you just described in enclosed spaces, why at least wearing a mask can protect you and, more importantly, protect your neighbors? I mean, that's what we're really talking about here. Right. We don't have a magic bullet for this virus. We don't have one thing that is going to stop it. So it's a combination of things that we do that is going to determine what summer looks like and what fall looks like in regards to the transmission of this virus and you know, the restrictions that are put on us. So we need to socially distance. Um, we need the safer at home. If you can stay home, do it. But masks are a piece of this puzzle. They, at the absolute minimum, they catch your respiratory droplets going out into the environment, into spaces that you're sharing with other people, which lowers the chance that they can become infected. At the best, they do that and they protect you, depending on the mask. So taken together with all the other bits that we do, masks are an important piece of this puzzle to stop this virus getting into you and into your home. Um, the other kind of big element that we have heard a lot about is contact tracing. A lot of contact tracers are going to be hired because I guess we really don't have a lot in this country right now. Um, can you talk to us about, as we move forward, because people are going to get out there, infections are going to rise, the importance of proper contact tracing? Yeah, the test, trace, and isolate program is really one of the most important pieces in this puzzle, and people are buying into how important it actually is. Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, South Korea, fantastic test, trace, and isolate. If you can use that program to find people um, that are infected through the testing and then identify their contacts that they've had over the preceding four, five, six days and get them isolated so that they're not part of the, disease, uh, the virus transmission chain, it's an incredibly important piece to stopping the amplification of this virus throughout the community. We don't want the numbers to come back up. Masks are important, social distancing are important, but contact tracing done correctly to get a potential infected person out of the community before they can infect somebody else or three other people, which it is with this virus, is a really important piece of the entire puzzle to solving uh, this problem that we have. Uh, Professor Aaron Bromage, um, your blog is excellent, excellent, excellent. I encourage people to check it out. I posted it on all my social media um, platforms. Um, great talking to you. Thank you very much for having me on the show and thank you for the kind words about my writing.